Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Eck and you're watching Eck Math. Today we're going to talk about polynomials. Polynomials are a special type of mathematical expression or object uh, and we are going to officially define them but I think it's easier to look at them by example. So on this lovely graphic that I have stolen from the internet uh, there are three examples of polynomials on the left side and some examples of things that are not polynomials on the right side and it might be good for you to take a look at that and see if you can figure out what makes something a polynomial. If you've had a chance to think about it, uh, there's a couple things I observe when I look at this. Uh, one is that I do see that there's always a variable in a polynomial. And we have a lot of x's, although the non-polynomials also have x's. So maybe it's not just the presence or absence of an x. Um, what I notice, though, is that they do seem to have exponents on the x's. And that seems like it's going to be really important. Um, and I'm highlighting above this x here because it is, in fact, an x to the first. Um, and so having uh, powers of x is important. And you could even think about this 9, for example, as being an x to the 0 power. Uh, so there is actually an x in each term in a polynomial. Uh, but in non-polynomials, what you'll notice is that you might have things like negative exponents on the x, or square roots, which are like fractional exponents, or this is like a negative exponent again, or an x on the denominator, um, which are not good. You can have polynomials with multiple terms. Um, they don't have to be arranged in descending order of power, although often they are. Um, a lot of folks think that polynomials must have an x, but it is actually true that, for example, 5 is a polynomial. And why is that? Well, because it's something like 5x to the 0. So a polynomial is an expression that is a combination of uh, x's, exponents, coefficients, and operation, subtraction or uh, addition in between. Uh, the coefficients on all these examples are just like real numbers um, or are, are actually integers, but they could be any real number. So I think I have some examples here. Um, here's some more examples of polynomials. And you notice that the coefficients could be a fraction. That's allowed. Um, you don't have to have just x's. You can have multiple variables. Those are all allowed. Those are all OK. And you can, of course, have single numbers or constant terms. Um, here are kind of the rules about what cannot be uh, considered a polynomial. You can't divide by a variable. You can't have negative exponents, which are kind of the same thing. You can't have decimal or fractional exponents. And you do have to have a finite number of terms. You can have as many terms as you want. You could have a hundred, you could have a thousand, you could have a million terms, but it has to be finite. So those are the rules for polynomials. Let's construct the official definition of polynomial. Um, you don't really work with this definition a lot like in class every day, but I think it's important to understand and work with this type of mathematical definition. And I think it's maybe the first one of our year that, that's very mathematical in this way. Um, so you can, of course, see it in your book if you want. Um, I'm going to say my polynomial will have n terms. And so the first term is going to have a coefficient, an x, and an exponent. And since it has n terms, I'm going to say that the highest exponent is the nth exponent. Uh, now, I'm going to need a lot of coefficients. So I'm going to do something to this a, which is actually I'm going to call it a sub n. And that's not an operation. It's not an exponent. That's a subscript. And altogether, a sub n means, all it means is the coefficient of the nth power of x. Since n is the highest power of x, we're also going to call this particular coefficient the leading coefficient. This n, since it's the highest power, is also very useful in polynomials, and we're going to give it a special name. We're going to call this the degree of the polynomial. We'll talk more about that later. Now, we said polynomials can have more than one term, so I'm going to write the next term now. So I'm going to say plus, well, the next term, I don't know what n was. I know I have to have an x, and I have to have an exponent, and I'm going to say that the next term will have one less exponent than the term before it. So I'm going to say that that has an exponent of n minus 1. 
and then I need a coefficient on that term. I could do like b, but I'm kind of being systematic here, so I'm going to say that the coefficient is a sub n minus 1. And remember that this whole thing is the coefficient even with the subscript. So those are the coefficients. Um, I will add the coefficients have to be real numbers. Exponents have to be integers. Nope, that's wrong. They have to be whole numbers. Integers could be negative, which is not allowed, uh, but whole numbers have to be positive. Let's keep writing out some terms. So the next term would be uh, the n minus 2 term. So I would have the coefficient a sub n minus 2, that's the coefficient, times x to the power of n minus 2. And I'm just going down. I'm going to make a note, by the way, that I said there's n terms. They don't have to be n terms. I'm going to say up to n terms because any of these a's n coefficients could be 0. You've probably seen this before, right? If you've seen the polynomial x squared minus 1, there's a missing x term. That's because it's really plus 0x minus 1. Uh, so any of these ans could be 0. Uh, now, we don't know how big n is, so I'm going to get really bored of writing all this. So here's the math trick we use. I say plus, and I put a little ellipses, dot, 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 and then I pick up at the end of the pattern. I know there's an end of the pattern because I have to have a finite number of terms. So I'm going to say, uh, let's see, the second to last term would be a sub 1, x to the 1, and then I need an a sub 0, x to the 0, which we don't usually write. And that last term has a special name too. That's called the constant term, which is usually just a number. So that's our mathematical definition of a polynomial. Uh, let's take a look at some other some properties of this. I think we're going to look at degree. Yes. So degree is, uh, again, one of those things that is useful. It's not too tricky once you wrap your head around it, but it takes a little bit of work. Um, the reason we introduce this new term is because if I'm looking at two polynomials, 13x squared or 1 half x cubed, and I say which is larger, uh, someone who is not thinking super hard might say, well, obviously 13x squared is larger. But then if you were to look at, for example, the graphs of these, 13x squared would grow like a parabola, but 1 half x cubed, I know you maybe not graphed this yet, but even though it has a 1 half out there, x cubed grows a lot faster than x squared. So this would eventually, you know, x, third, x squared would be bigger for a while, but then x cubed would actually increase faster because it has that higher exponent. So there's this sense that degree or exponent is actually the best way to compare the size of a polynomial. Why do we care about the size of a polynomial or of a term? Well, it helps us construct its graph if we don't know the graph already. Uh, so in this case, which is bigger? I would say 1 half x cubed is bigger, even though it has a smaller leading coefficient because it has degree 3. And this only has degree of two. I'm going back up to this list of polynomials because I wanted to just run through and look at the degrees of each of these by way to make an example. So 3x, this is 3x to the first. This is degree 1. By the way, degree 1 we also call linear x minus 2 is x to the first minus 2. This is also degree 1. So there's not, you don't like add the, the degrees or the exponents between terms. Uh, 6y squared minus 7 ninths x. 2 is the highest exponent, so that's a degree 2. 3xyz. So this is where it gets a little tricky when you have multiple variables, which is, by the way, something we don't have in math 4 very often. You have to wait until multivariable calculus, probably two or three years from now, before you really get into these. Um, but if you were looking at the degrees, you look at each term, but you then add the exponents of the variables because they're multiplied together. So that would be a degree 3 term, but wait, there's more. Look at this second term. This has an x to the first, a y to the second, and a z to the first. So this thing is actually going to be degree 4 uh, when you add up those terms, but you don't add them up between terms. Uh, we have a v to the fifth and w to the fifth. This is degree five. And five here is a degree zero polynomial, which we call a constant polynomial. So that's kind of how you approach degree. You can put yourself to the test here. Uh, look at the polynomial on the screen and 
say to yourself, what is the degree of this polynomial? You'd be looking for the term which has the highest sum total of exponents. And if you look hard enough, you'll notice that the second term here has a total exponent of 6. So this polynomial has a degree of 6. For the next minute of this video, I'm going to kind of diverge from our book. Our book does a great example of teaching you what polynomials are, but it doesn't teach you why you should care about them. So here's why mathematicians care about polynomials. Uh, we like them because they're often functions of x that have an unrestricted domain. That means they're defined everywhere. So you can take any x you want and put them in. That's not true with all general equations, right? Sometimes you might have a square root equation where you can't have all inputs. The graphs of polynomials, and this is the most important property, are smooth, continuous curves. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I have a couple examples here. This is a fifth degree polynomial. You have no idea in general what the graph of this is, but it's a polynomial, which means that you can fairly expect the graph of it to be something that's smooth and continuous and extends off infinitely in all directions because all x's are valid possible inputs. And it's not going to have any sharp corners. It's not going to have any breaks. It's not going to have any uh, vertical asymptote behavior where it, it takes, a, you know, takes a, a pause and then comes back some other way. None of that is going to happen with a polynomial, and that's what makes them so nice. There's kind of a whole branch of mathematics uh, that you'll see a little bit of in calculus that uh, takes a more complicated function and models a polynomial to that function so that you can like, program it into a computer. Um, that's one way, for example, that you might process uh, data. Or if you're receiving a, a really complicated signal from the radio and you have all this messy uh, data that's maybe not perfect because it got distorted coming through the air, you might take that and fit a polynomial model to it so that you can work with the data in a functional, useful way. So there's whole branches of mathematics that involve taking uh, hard things and turning them into polynomials because polynomials are easy and beautiful. Um, I also made a little note, polynomials are smooth and continuous even in 3D. So we said, you know, those polynomials with x and y and maybe z, well, those exist too, but they don't look like this. They might look something like this, which I prepared earlier. Um, and you will eventually, if you, if you keep doing math, you'll learn all about graphing things like this. And what you can notice is that, uh, at least within the viewing box, which uh, does cut off a little bit, this is a smooth, continuous curve, kind of like a bed sheet something that doesn't have any holes or rips or tears or, or, or jumps. And that's why polynomials are so beautiful and so nice. And I'll contrast this with something that's not a polynomial. Look at this graph. Okay, it's got a big gap in the middle. What happens in the middle? Well, there's like three pieces of this graph that came from one equation. That's not a polynomial. You might say, Mr. Eck, why is that not a polynomial? Well, you have an x on the bottom. That could be written on the top as x to the negative 1. So as soon as you have that negative exponent, you're in trouble. You know it's not a polynomial. And what has happened to this graph? It's not nice. Okay, that's the theory. Now what do you do with these things? Well, one thing that you might do is uh, add or subtract them. Uh, adding and subtracting polynomials works just like you'd expect uh, adding and subtracting them too if you've been adding and subtracting uh, quadratics and things, which you, I think you have been for years. Basically, all you have to do is combine your like terms. And if you're subtracting, I always remind kids to be careful with your negatives and make sure you subtract all the terms. Um, here is what I'm going to do. Take this problem, pause the video, try to work it out. I'm going to do the same and I'll join you in a couple seconds with an answer. So if you combine all your like terms and make sure you're subtracting properly, you should get something like 6x cubed plus 10x squared plus 11x minus 8. Now let's move on to multiplication. So multiplying polynomials um, can be tricky. Often, you may have heard the term FOIL, F-O-I-L. Um, if you haven't, good. I don't actually think FOIL is a very good way to talk about polynomials. It just happens to be a way that people uh, know how to talk about multiplying polynomials. You want to kind of use that term. Um, and if you've never learned FOIL, I don't know, that's probably good for you, in all honesty. Um, FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, and last. So the idea of multiplying with FOIL uh, is that it would only work with a two by two or you know two terms times two terms and you do the first terms the outer terms the inside terms 
and then the last two terms. Um, and then you would combine all like terms that need to be combined. Here there's nothing that combines because they're all different letters. The problems with FOIL are twofold. One, uh, you don't have to do it in that order, first, outer, inner, last. I don't think I ever, except for just now, actually multiply polynomials in that order that I just did it. Um, so you can do them in any order you want. It doesn't have to be that way. And two, first, outer, inner, last as a mnemonic only works if you have four terms. And just beneath you, you can see, what if you have six terms? Where do you, what do you do with, with those other things? So FOIL is actually not a very good way to, to use but what I suspect a lot of you do, and what I do, is I might say, oh, I'm going to FOIL this out. I don't actually do that process. I do something different that really is the distributive property. So let's talk about why this works for a second. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to keep my A, B, C, and D. Imagine that you just had uh, a B. It means to have B times the quantity C plus D. Well, that B would distribute to both the C and the D. So you would get bc plus bd. But now imagine that you didn't have the b term and you did have the a term. The a would distribute to both terms as well and you would get ac and ad. And that would give you kind of the fully multiplied out version if you just combine both of them. And that's what's happening when you multiply two polynomials. It's really like a two-step distributive property, um, no matter the order that you do it in. Um, and that's kind of how I think about it usually, is I'll distribute the A to both, uh, and then the B to both, and it's kind of how I do it. Um, now I'm going to do the same example, we're going to use this example three times, uh, to show you three ways of multiplying polynomials that might be a little larger. Um, and of course, in the end, you can choose the way you want, uh, but I really like showing all three, because I think everyone can, have, can learn at least one new thing by uh, approaching these with different methods. So... First, I'm going to multiply with the distributive property. Uh, so the distributive property says I'm going to take this 2x and distribute it to each of these three terms. And then I'm going to take the 3 and distribute it to each of these three terms and add the results. So 2x times x cubed. I'm going to speed this up in post. And we'll do the red. Then you're going to combine your like terms. And you should get that as your result. Um, it is okay to kind of like underline or, or highlight or cross out things as you combine them. I really like to do that to make sure I've caught everything. Um, but kind of you, you'll develop a method that works for you. So that's the standard distribution method. That's probably what most folks use. And it's probably what I would use in something that's, that's even uh, this level of complicated. Um, but say that things were even more complicated. Maybe I have three terms times three terms. Then another way to set this up is to create a box that just helps you with your distribution. So the way the box works is I make a literal rectangle. On the outside of the rectangle, I write the terms of each of the polynomials. Doesn't really matter if you put the plus signs in between. And then you multiply each term and just write the answer at the intersection. So now I have six terms, I have to combine like terms. One reason I do like the box method better is that a really interesting thing happens. Look at how all of the terms with the same degree are actually aligned on the diagonals. That makes it really easy to combine like terms. So we would have 2x cubed, then I easily see 8 plus 3 is, easily see 12 plus 10. And yep. so that's using the box method. Uh, the diagonals only work if you're not missing any terms, right? So if I was like missing that x term, it wouldn't quite line up, but it would still be uh, organized in a nice way. So I like the box method too. 
And then finally, this method I didn't actually know until I started teaching it. And I just think it's cool because this method is multiplying just like you would multiply the number uh, 145 times the number 23. How would you do that one, right? You would to the three times all of these, and you put it down here, and then you do the, you'd place like a placeholder, and you do the two and the four and the one. Guess what? You can do the same thing with polynomials. And in fact, I don't know if you caught this. Where did I get these numbers from? It was the coefficients of that polynomial. So there's, there's a real link between these two properties. Uh, so how does this go? Well, any line, I'm multiplying. 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times 4x is 12x. 3 times x squared is 3x squared. 2x times 5 is 10x. Now here, you can put a placeholder 0, or you can just line up the terms that match. So I have 10x, and I could just put it under the 12x. 2x times 4x is 8x squared. So I put it under the x squared. 2x times x squared is 2x to the third. And then, just like normal multiplication, you add the results. Normally, you add from left to right. With polynomials, you're not going to be carrying, so it doesn't matter. And so that's how you solve a problem like that. We're going to end this video by talking about some special techniques for multiplying specific uh, situations. And I would direct you to a chart that you can also find on page 53 of your textbook, uh, or you can just copy down from here. It's the same thing. Um, there's three special products and two that are really important. One uh, is if you have a difference of squares or a, a conjugate pair. We saw this last video, I think, when we were doing uh, rationalizing. You have the pattern a plus b times a minus b. When you multiply that out, you're going to get a b uh, no you're not you're going to get a squared plus a b minus a b plus minus b squared and then those middle terms will cancel out and you'll just get a squared minus b squared always and yes you could every time write out those middle terms but then every time they would cancel out and eventually you would realize you're just kind of wasting effort by writing out the middle terms so if you could do anything right now to prepare yourself for the entire year of pre-calc, it is learn and love this pattern. You will use it all the time. Uh, second to that pattern is the pattern of a perfect square, a plus b quantity squared. One thing to remember is that this is not a squared plus b squared. Doesn't work. Plug in a number, test it, won't work. What it is, is a, b, uh, nope, a squared plus a, b plus b, a, right? So the middle terms are not alternating anymore, plus b squared, and you have a middle term uh, that ends up being 2ab, and it's the same with sub uh, subtraction. So whenever you have that, you can always know how something's going to multiply out when you have a perfect square. And there's some examples on the side that I'll, you know, you can pause and read on your own. Um, there is, by the way, also a pattern for a perfect cube. Let's zoom in on this. You don't need to memorize this for me. Um, some people, if you're really trying to get all the different patterns, yeah, go ahead and memorize it. Um, I don't really memorize it, but I do know, I think in the previous math class, you've maybe learned about Pascal's triangle, and the coefficients from this do come from the Pascal's triangle. One, three, three, one. And so you may actually already know this pattern if you think hard enough about it. Um, that's all I really want to say about cubing. Um, but I want to go and do uh, two examples that involve sum and difference in perfect square that are a little bit sneaky. Uh, so we're going to leap ahead. And I did borrow this from the book just because it's they're really nice problems. Uh, we'll do the first one first. So you're doing 7x plus 5 plus 4y times 7x plus 5 minus 4y. And one way you could do this make yourself a three by three box and do seven x five and four y and go all the way around i'm not going to do that because look at what when you see um, the same thing with just one sign change you should be thinking about that difference of squares pattern so here's what i want you to see here notice that this could be your a 
and this could be your b. And then you have the pattern a plus b, a minus b. And so even though that a term is actually more complicated, it doesn't matter for the multiplication pattern. Uh, this is going to multiply into a squared minus b squared. Well, what's a? 7x plus 5 minus b squared, that's 4y squared. Then you just have to do each of those terms, and I like it this way. This is what tells me this problem is good, is I've kind of separated the x's from the y's. So uh, I'm not going to get some weird x, y's that are going to cancel or whatever. Um, 7x plus 5, that's a perfect square. So it's going to be 49x squared plus 2ab, so 2 times 7x times 5, which I'll simplify in a second, then plus 25. 4y squared is going to be minus 16y squared. Don't forget that you have to square the 4 in this case because that whole thing is like the b term. Uh, so 2 times 7 times 5 is uh, 70, so altogether this would be 49x squared plus 70x plus 25 minus 16y squared, um, and I would say you can leave it there. A lot of students say, Mr. Eck, don't you need to put the y squared over here because it's a higher power? I'm like, yes, but also that rule about descending degree really only work, applies to me when you have um, powers of x only. When you have x's and y's, it's less clear which is like the most, I don't know, important power, so you can leave it in whatever order makes the most sense. Um, I like this way. This, the graph of this is probably some kind of uh, hyperbola because you have a positive x squared and a negative y squared. So it actually makes sense to leave the x and y separate uh, if someone were to graph it later. Just you know, fun fact, uh, you might remember from hyperbolas from last year, uh, depending on what you learned before this class. Okay, next one. Uh, 3x plus y plus 1 quantity squared. And again, you could turn this into a boom, 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 big box and do everything together. Um, but I want to isolate two special terms. I see a 3x. I also see a y plus 1. I say, huh, x's and y's are weird together. What if I separate them and call 3x my a and y plus 1 my b? So when I have this, then a plus b squared, the pattern is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So what happens here? Well, then I have 3x squared plus 2 times 3x times y plus 1. And then I have y plus 1 squared. And then uh, you kind of got everything out. It's all in one line. Now you just have to simplify it. So we have 9x squared plus uh, 6xy plus 6x, so that's from taking this and distributing it, 6x, to a y and a, and a 1. And then you have y plus 1 squared, which is y squared plus 2y plus 1. Just barely fit on the screen there. Make some more room. Uh, and then let's group. Are there any like terms to group? No. Uh, so I am just going to just group maybe the x and y terms together and write this as 9x squared plus 6x plus 6xy plus y squared plus 2y plus 1, although that last step was really not necessary. So those are just examples of how you can use your knowledge of special products to multiply things a little more efficiently than you otherwise would. And it's important to practice those products now when you're multiplying, because in the next section, we will be factoring. And in that section on factoring, it really, really helps if you can recognize the special products whenever they appear. Um, so that is the end of the video. Uh, two places that polynomials show up are in the very next section, we talk about factoring. And then about uh, two chapters later, we talk about graphing, how to graph those smooth curves by hand. And to be able to graph those smooth curves, you have to be able to multiply, divide, and factor polynomials all together. So it's really, really important to be comfortable with these mathematical objects. Uh, well, that's all for now. Leave any questions you have below in your comments or, or shoot me an email. You've been watching ECMATH. Thank you all. Have a nice day.